everyone, welcome to PM SIG. We're excited to welcome Ben Brodsky tonight. And he's going to be speaking with John Bach. And it's going to be a really fun chat. So we're just going to let everyone um, join and just give a few seconds before we get started. Yeah, should be an interesting talk. I love the title, Make a Career Ch Shift Without Starting Over. So <laughs> I hope I've ever get something out of it except for my employees <laughs> <laughs> right right all right well why don't we kick things off joe do you want to start with the intro yeah go for it john thanks joe uh so joe is the uh ceo of uh of cordev uh and of course you know that and for years he's uh sponsored this uh uh, QA SIG, but this is PM SIG, so meant for product program or project managers. Um, started almost as a as an inside joke um, when I presented at QA SIG a few years ago, confessing that I had defected from the world of QA into the world of PM. And our guest tonight, uh, Ben Brodsky, is uh, a fellow I worked with uh, in my last job before uh, starting at eBay 11 years ago at LexisNexis. Uh, 11 years under, already? It's wow. been 11 years already. And uh, Ben was a, a clear uh, standout in, in QA and thought thought differently. Um, and uh, uh, and it turns out, uh, I learned recently, that um, Ben has a, a background uh, not only in QA like I used to have, because now we're both PMs, but but in, uh, in investigation and in forensics. Um, and and I and I started in journalism. So Ben and I like tandemly in parallel in parallel lives. We've had three different careers. So I was really excited when I approached him, and he agreed to do uh, this this one on one uh, with me uh, about making career changes without completely starting over. Because you'll you'll find perhaps in in the narrative uh, that he's about to to start that there are parallels in these careers uh, that attract us and and keep us on a path of nourishment of things that we we want to do and uh that are that are um similar between those careers so so without further ado um ben i'll let you kick it off in a, in a few slides you have and as you tell your narrative of a uh, bit about you yourself and and um uh the tonight's thing yeah, welcome, Ben. I'm going to sign off uh, visually for everybody, and I'll come back on later. Okay. Thanks, John. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, well, great. Well, thanks, John. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see. I, I'm sharing my screen. So, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, it's, you know, it's always a pleasure to hear from you and to get to collaborate on something with you again is always, you know, a big joy for me. So thanks. So, um, welcome everyone to the SIG. Um, yeah, like John said, I, I have a, a few slides, not not a lot. Um, I think the the format that John and I were discussing was to do more of like a, a talk show host interview style. So it'll be you know less formal. Um, we're gonna make sure that there's lots of questions uh, for the end, uh, so we're gonna leave space for that. Um, but yeah, so let me let me give a high level of you know set the set the stage for my journey, how I got there, and the things that were running through my mind as I was making these different um, uh, jumps in career. Um, so, you know, a little bit about me, I'm Ben Brodsky. I am a senior program manager at Adobe um, and supporting a program called Premiere Pro, um, which is, it's a huge program. It has a large um, uh, following, a huge community. Um, it's the second largest revenue generating app in all of Adobe behind Photoshop, which is kind of a bizarre because Photoshop is like a verb now. It's not even just a, an app by itself. It's, you know, you can Photoshop something. It's crazy. Um, but Premiere Pro is like, you know, right behind them. And it's the program that um, Hollywood uses, um, CNN, Disney, like, you know, all of your favorite Hollywood movies are probably used, um, you know, After Effects or Premiere or, you know, one of the Adobe uh, uh, software solutions that we got. So, um, so yeah, I get to work on this amazing product and, um, how did I get there? Um, so 
yeah, I mean, as I was putting this together, it didn't really uh, occur to me. I'd always kind of thought myself as having one career jump, going from criminal investigator to software quality engineer. But in putting this together, it occurred to me that I had made two jumps because going from software quality engineer to program manager is a jump in and of itself, even though it's still within the same industry. Um, and so that was a you know piece of the puzzle that I hadn't really put my put my mind on before putting this together. But um, but the the thing the theme that always held true throughout all of those was that it was the same mindset. Um, and you know same mindset is you know like this you're inquisitive you're looking through from end to end you're thinking about um, you know things that aren't being told to you outright but you're sussing out the information that you need. Um, and so going from a criminal investigator to a software uh, quality engineer, the way that I described this was you would get something called discovery. Uh, and we have a picture of what a typical case file might look like. So one of these you know, green or orange uh, binders here, that would be like a case file. Um, and what you'd get is you'd get this large uh, documentation of uh, police reports or witness testimonies or, you know, photos, evidence, um, but it would only be half written. And it was this mystery novel, right? So you get this mystery novel, half written. Um, and then what I, my job would be is that I would sit down and read through these different perspectives, um, different point of views, and write down questions about, well, if this person saw this event from this perspective, and this person saw a slightly different event, from a different perspective, you know, where do those things need to intersect to make the make a, a plausible truth? Um, and so you you know you would write down all these questions. You do a lot of background searches on people to find out you know things about them that they didn't know you knew. Um, it was this really interesting line of work in that you would know a ton of information before you even talk to somebody. And I found that I would even be like a little starstruck sometimes, or it would be that same feeling. Um, because I would go in and talk to someone and know all about their background and their history and where they went to school and, you know, their relationships and divorce or whatever. And they'd have no idea that I knew any of this. And it was, um, you know, it was an interesting um, position to be in because what I would need to do through that is, you know, learn how to gain trust from people pretty quickly. And so, um, you know, I'd, I'd use that. Uh, knowledge that I gained on situations to, you know, build relationships quickly, earn people's trust, not inorganically. I mean, it was all, you know, I wasn't trying to manipulate them, but, um, but it would help because I could find commonalities that were something that I had done or experienced in the past that I could, you know, uh, level with them on. Um, anyway, so I'd go through, I'd read all of this information. I, you know, would stop halfway through. I would do my investigation. Um, and you know, uh, interview witnesses, and sometimes those witnesses would then send me to other witnesses that the police ha hadn't even talked to yet. Um, and, and so I would build this case, and I would finish the story effectively, and then give it to the attorney and say, "Okay, here you go." Um, and then they would go do their litigation, uh, and I would go on to the next case. And it was like, "This is great! I totally, totally loved it." Um, and the theme from that was, you know, I was inquisitive, you had to pay attention to the details, gain people's trust quickly. And so those are the three, the three things that I would have to, you know, often do. Um, sometimes it wouldn't be just, you know, like a, a single case like this. Like there was, there was one case um, where there was an Olympic pipeline uh, explosion back in 1999 uh, up in Bellingham. And it was, it was awful. Like it killed three people. Um, two of them were these 10 year old boys, uh, the King and the divorce family. Um, and so I was working for, uh, for, I was working on that case and I was hired by those families, the, the attorney that was hired by those families to, um, read through documentation. Um, the, there was, we requested service records basically on, miles and miles and miles of pipeline that had run all up and down the western coast um and you know 10 years of records going back and to see you know basically see if you could find evidence of something that they did wrong of why this explosion happened and negligence on their part um 
And so this is what this looked like is my, my job was going up to a room up in Bellingham uh, or Mount Vernon actually um, and reading for eight hours a day, five days a week for like six months and cataloging. And, um, you know, it was super fascinating, but it was uh, often lonely, <laughs> but all the same, um, you know, working for attorneys was, was amazing. Um, I loved, I loved the investigation side of it. Um, but I wasn't always crazy about the clients. Uh, one thing that I, you know, from, from here, I worked, um, as a staff investigator, as a small, at a small private law firm. Um, I'd worked in, uh, the public defenders before that. So, you know, public defender was like legal defense for those who can't afford an attorney. Uh, then I was hired at this small private firm. Um, and that was for, you know, uh, people that could uh, pay for legal defense. Um, so again, I mean, I, I love the investigation process, but I also, I didn't feel like this was, you know, I wanted, I wanted to do investigation, but I wanted to do it in a different way. Um, and so I, you know, started to think about a change. Um, and so where this change kind of occurred for me was I took a ride, a motorcycle ride with a friend who worked for a video game company here at Microsoft. Um, and he said, hey, I need to swing by my office real quick. Can we go? Uh, you know, pick something up at my office and then we'll be on our way. I said, sure. And so we did, and we walked into this building and that's when he introduced me to the world of tech jobs. Um, and it, you know, life changed for me because I thought, wait a minute, you know, you don't, there's a different way to make a living where you don't have to wake up and interview police officers at three in the morning and, uh, you know, represent people that, you know, maybe probably have done some pretty terrible things, but still, you know, you want to represent them to the best that you can. There's another way to make a living and still do investigation. Like, tell me more. So we started talking and, you know, I described to him the same way I just described to you about, you know, getting um, all of your discovery and, you know, turning that into, you know, a report that you give. Um, and he said, you know, that what you're doing is in investigation, it sounds a lot like software investigation. I didn't even know this was a career at that point. So I started thinking about it and I said, wow, you know, you're, you're right. You know, quality assurance is an investigation of software instead of a criminal case or, you know, people you're investigating software. You're looking at a tech spec instead of the discovery or a design document, seeing, you know, what's different. Um, writing your your questions out that you would ask people um, part of the investigation. Instead, now you're going to be writing bug reports. So there was a lot of similarity. It was like a slight, uh, it was a different um, uh, execution, but the methodology being inquisitive, um, you know, thinking about it from different perspectives, all of those things were parallel for me. And so that, that's the piece that, um, you know, is really at the at the heart of this talk is, is if you're looking to make a change, you want to think about the things that you're doing now and how they can apply to the career that you want to do next. Because, you know, I was, you know, as an investigator, I had spent time and money and went back to school for it, got certified. I mean, there was a lot of time and, and I thought that this was going to be my forever job until I found something different. And when I did, I was, I, I had to figure out, okay, what are the things that I've invested in the, the, the focus areas that I've really invested in? How can I parlay those into the career that I want, but still maintain those things at its core? So, so I did that and that led me into the world of tech jobs. Um, started working at, you know, Microsoft as a video game tester, um, and that was a contract to, you know, see if I liked it and I did, I loved it. Um, and so I started thinking, okay, well, if I'm going to get a full-time job doing this, you know, how can I make it even more closely, uh, linked to the work that I had done in the past? So I started looking at products that I had used in the past in the legal field. And one of those was LexisNexis. I had used LexisNexis. For anyone that ha doesn't know that company, it's a uh, legal software um, tool set. And um, I used them a ton uh, in my role as an investigator, looking up cases in other states and, you know, finding um, background checks on people. 
And so but and there was always there's lots of things that I thought, oh man, I wish the I wish it did X. You know, I wish this product would do something different, or I would find a bug, or I, you know, some the site would crash on me when I did a, the same action. And so I always kind of geeked out on that. Um, but at this point, I said, okay, well, I have some software quality background. Um, I have some legal background. Let me go look and see if I can merge those two. So I looked at LexisNexis and there was a position for a tester and I applied and um, made the case and they said, yeah, you seem like you'd be a great fit. So I started working there and I'm glad that I did because that's when I met John. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, um, you know, a big pivotal part for me in my career because, you know, John, you, you know, you really changed, um, you know, my view on, you know, what software quality could be. I had a, I had a very, I would call it a narrow focus on, you know, it just seemed like if you can find, you know, one bug an hour, you're doing great. But then, you know, John would bring me into these um, different ways of, uh, you know, challenging my, my way of thinking about quality. And, um, you know, so I was like, I was very, very thankful I got to, to meet you. Um, one of the things, and John, I don't know if you were even a part of this. I don't think you were because you were uh, managing us, but there was at, at, um, Lexus Nexus, we had a um, really long uh, weekly session on um, backlog grooming or, or sprint planning. Sorry, it was in sprint planning, and there was certain things that it, it was so painful <laughs> as a individual. And I thought, oh man, there's got to be a better way to do this. Like, there's, you know, there's is there a technology we can use or a different way to communicate? Like, there's got to be some way to do this. And I I started to um, you know, look at the things that John, that you were in, you were inviting us to do like Dawn Patrol, which was something that I had never thought of to do before. Or, um, you know, there was this color coding theory uh, that, you know, you and I talked about, and there was actually a different talk that, you know, we gave together. Um, but all of these were around process changes and how can you look at, um, you know, what you're doing in a different way. And so it was right around that time, um, well, actually, uh, LexisNexis shut down our whole department, if I remember correctly. But so we were we were forced to you know make a move. But it was at that time that I thought, okay, if I'm interested in investigating and and looking at process change, what you know what could a career uh, in that respect look like? I hadn't thought of program management before that. Um, but what I realized was, you know, as I'm investigating uh, process, is that well, program management is just an investigation of process. So I went from investigation of software, well, first to of it, you know criminal cases to software, and I thought, well, how can I leverage that same line of thinking? So, investigation of process. Um, so from there, then I was kind of off to the races. Uh, you know, I started working as a project manager um, at Razorfish, you know, which was uh, marketing. Um, there was, you know, uh, Starbucks, Deloitte Digital. Slalom L4, and you know, finally have arrived at Adobe, where I just I feel like this is where I I want my forever company to be. This is um, where I want to retire. Um, love it, and um, but so yeah, I mean, you know, throughout all of these different places, I've you know always tried to remain remember that the major theme of my um, career and the thing that I'm drawn to, and I, something that I started doing from the very beginning is just investigative. Uh, having that investigative mindset. And so that's how I made the, the move from a criminal investigator to a software investigator to what I think now as a process investigator. Um, so that's that's it. So that's the, you know, that's the end of my slides. Uh, you know, if you need to contact me, I'm sure I will have make sure I have my contact information for everybody. But um, but yeah, I'll stop sharing and then John, let's what what questions do you have or what can I tell you about anything? Uh, I love your slides, by the way. Um, and so let me go to my first career, journalism. Um, I have a BA in journalism from the University of Maine from 1990, and I want to use it right now. Uh, this, and this is still fun for me because it's, like you pointed out in, in your talk, it's, it's about themes and patterns. And the theme of journalism and testing and program management is investigation. I totally agree. It's questioning. It's making a report. It's, it's giving people information and learning interesting things. Now, yes, sometimes we get 28 boxes of, of papers to go through, but you're looking for that needle in the haystack that no one else may have found or could find except you. 
in in it. It's it's a uh, it's like mining for gold, like those gold reality shows, right? Like you know, Alaska gold miners, and yeah. they come up with a lot of dirt to get the the pay dirt, like literally. So the it's clear to me what your mission was, what your themes were, and so my first question is. Uh, for for people in our audience who are feeling stuck and feeling like maybe in the great resignation period we're kind of still in even though now we're seeing you know layoffs and and you know the economy go a little bit down with some headwinds um what what would your advice be to someone who is feeling like well i'm 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 stuck and i i don't have an awareness of what else is out there i do i just have to stumble into it and be lucky or can I be deliberate about what might be out there that is close to what I love to do? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I think I see what you're saying. I, the, what, I mean, well, I think there's lots of different answers for that. My approach would be to, you know, reach out to people that you think are in a career uh, that you are interested in, um, and be candid and be open and say, hey, I am this, but I am really interested in learning more about what you do. Could I, you know, buy you a cup of coffee or maybe a digital cup of coffee in this, you know, in the COVID times or however you want to do it. But, but you know, the, the, what I would do is try to make a connection with that person and learn about what they do from them. Um, I found that people like to talk about themselves and like to talk about their work. Um, I, uh, and you know, and, and I know people are busy, but it's one of those things where you know, LinkedIn, for example, is a great example of a, a huge network where you know, often I mean, you might you might find people that are not interested, but you'll probably find somebody that is. Um, there is a somebody that I get to work with, um, and she reached out to me and was interested in Adobe. Uh, this is I want to say maybe two years, three years ago. Um, I had just started at Adobe. And, you know, she said, hey, I'm interested in Adobe. I want to know more. And, you know, let's meet up for coffee. And I was thrilled, you know, completely excited because here I was at a company that I really believed in, um, in a career that I loved. And so somebody else who was interested in the same things that I'm interested in, heck yeah. Like I would love nothing more than to spend, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes talking with them. And um, because of that initial coffee, um, you know, through, you know, there was a, a, I would say, I mean, I was imp so impressed with her and, you know, where she was coming from and where she was going that I wanted to help. And, you know, the more people that you can connect with and who become your advocates, um, you know, the better chances you are of going to, one, really understanding the work that you think you want to get into. And, you know, is that really the work that I want to get? Because you might also find that, you know, in talking, you're like, well, this isn't really for me, but I'm glad I found that out through, it's almost like a prototype, you know, it's a really lightweight way of finding out if you like this versus spending a year in, in the career, you know, so, um, but yeah, and then, and then working with her, and then she joined as an intern, and then she um, was hired on full time, and now we work together every day, and it's, and it's great, but it's all because of just her reaching out throwing a line through LinkedIn and saying, you know, I'd love to learn more about the company and the work that you do. So there's a one example of how it worked for somebody. Okay. Uh, while you were talking, a, a, a theme occurred to me too. Um, and that is about feelings. And, and that is you had a feeling as a crime scene investigator or as, a, or as an investigator, you had a feeling as a tester, you have a feeling now as a program manager what if you think about your best feeling that you had as an investigator and your best feeling you had as a tester and your best feeling that you had now as a program manager what feeling do you think is when you think of all three major feelings um what do they have in common in all three where you felt the best in each role uh that i mean well it seems like it's an easy answer for me at this point in my life because when I so the teams that I get to work with at Adobe, um, I, I I pay very close attention to. I mean, maybe it's because we're through Zoom or you know Teams or whatever tool you're using. Um, I try to pay really close attention to uh, their you know what what their face is saying, what their what their body language is saying. Um, there was a, a career coach that I worked with a couple of years ago that was very much like, she put this in, in my brain. She was like, you know, you got to remember to be audience focused. And I, I hadn't heard what that term 
meant before, but what it meant is, you know, you're thinking ahead of time, during the time, and then after the time, putting yourself in their position. And that's paid off to me in, in a lot of ways because reading people, um, and maybe it's the investigation side of me, you know, the criminal side of me, but uh, well, not criminal, but the criminal investigation side of me. Uh, but you know, reading reading the room, and you know, you can quickly pivot a meeting if you start to see people tuning out, or you know, you find that you know uh, a meeting is really well attended for a time, and then people start to drop off and not join the meetings after a time because you know that those these are all signals that you're getting to say that okay, what you're doing is not um, you know people people don't feel like they're spending their time in the best way they can. So there's a feeling that you can get by listening and, and watching for personal cues from other people, either by them not showing up or by people looking like they're tuning out or, you know, they start to, you know, look down at their phone. You know, you can read those visual cues. And then if you if you're paying attention to that, you can quickly pivot. And, you know, I've had good luck just even in the meeting itself to say, like, hey, you know, let's you know, what, what's the next thing we need to talk about to make this really valuable? And you, you know, start to engage people in a different way. Um, or, you know, you can come into a meeting with a completely new, fresh way of looking at something and saying, you know, hey, we usually do this meeting in one way. Um, what if we tried it today in a completely different way? We're still going to get to the, the nugget of information. Um, but, you know, what can, you know, let's, let's try it a slightly different way um, and see how people respond. And so, and that gives me a great sense of joy and pride when you change something up. Actually, you know, this happened, this happened today. Um, there was a, a, we call it a scrum of scrums. And it's a meeting, if, if for anyone that's not familiar with it, it's a, it's a meeting where um, you'll have a scrum meeting with your team and it's, you know, small, small group. And you just talk about like, you know, are you, what are you doing now? What are you doing next? And are you blocked? And, you know, if so, you kind of discuss that. Um, well, the management team then gets together at a subsequent meeting called the Scrum of Scrums, where, uh, you know, representatives from each of those individual Scrum teams get together and then they represent their teams. Uh, it's like a scaled agile approach. So in doing that, um, you know, we usually say the same sort of thing. Okay, are your teams, what are they doing now? What are they doing next? What are they blocked? And it's, um, and Today we did it in a slightly different way that was more had more of a retrospective feel. And one of the engineering managers um, just lit up when she heard that that was the the style that we we're going to do today. Because she was like, "Oh, this is great! This is my favorite uh, way to do these meetings." And so I was like, "Okay, great!" And and it was just that little spark that you could see that she was like engaged and excited to have a meeting. Like, who says that? Nobody says they're excited to have a meeting. And so just the fact that somebody wanted to do that and we're excited what that made my day for sure yeah it's a, the the theme that i hear there is is kind of resonance with other people that that matter and about about things that matter to them and this notion of discovery uh things are uncovered by default we have to go uncover them we have to discover them and to me that that is what we have in common with our three vocations with journalism testing and program management it seems like you I can I can resonate and relate to what you're saying because especially when someone says you're not going to find that or don't waste your time I'll, I like to say well we'll see because I know I'm representing a, maybe a silent majority of people out there stakeholders I work with that may go John I need you to find this I need you to look and be my second pair of eyes uh, on this because we could all be there's risk out there in the world which all three vocations share. And so I think your answer is really good about like, it's all about like P all three careers re require collaboration with people and, and this notion of what might hurt us together. And can someone be the guardian or the steward of, of an important piece of information that are hidden? So I think what, what emerges for me in your answer too is if someone in the audience is feeling stuck is look at these themes of discovery or mission or resonance with people or um, finding something and being discounted, but yet surprising people with what you are able to find out. Those may be resonating themes that may help you know who, who in your network is doing something that is interesting or important to you and have that virtual coffee kind of thing. Yeah. yeah that's, that's great. Um, 
Uh, another and, and another uh, thing you mentioned was gaining trust earlier, and that's another a component to to you, know, you have a service mindset. You want to help people. You want to help a project. You want to help a business. You want to help society. If you're an investigator, um, being helpful with that service mindset of what can I do to make a material difference when a lot of it is rhetoric and everybody's talk, but nobody's doing any action. So a thing like a scrum of scrum is really good because everybody's like, here's what I'm actually doing. And you can connect dots. And that's when all the silos come together, right? Those individual yeah. scrum teams. And yeah. for the first time they learn, oh, you're doing that. Oh, that's cool to know. That's, I'm glad I knew that because I was just about to do that. Yeah. So is there, is there something like in your, give, give me another thing like that from, from either investigation or, or your work in software quality um, or your current role that where you felt like, yeah, had I not been here, that wouldn't have happened. Well, yeah, uh, boy, I mean, there's, yeah, that, I feel like that happens a lot. Um, but, you know, there was, um, just to go back on one, something that you said where you're talking about, you know, when the teams get together and they, you know, that's the first time they hear what each other's, yeah. are, hear what each other's working on. Um, one of the other nice factors that comes out of that sometimes is that if a group is, or somebody is blocked on a team, um, what the other teams can then do, be, you know, they're, they're, these scrum, the different scrum teams are, there's four different teams, they call them teams of 10. So it's four different teams of 10 that work to create Premier. And, um, you know, if one of those teams has a member that's blocked from, you know, doing what they need to do for whatever reason, uh, it's not uncommon for the other teams to hop in and say, oh, you know, I, we had that problem before, like we can, I know someone that on my team that can help your guy or, um, or, you know, maybe we can, uh, you know, take something else that you guys were going to do and then you can, you know, share the load around so that a lot of work can still happen. But even if there's a blocker, um, it's not just something that impedes too much. Um, so that's that's one thing that I've noticed that's been really helpful. Um, I would say that, um, you know, something that I've, you know, I think hasn't or that wouldn't have happened had I, had I not been there. Um, and it, it goes back to some, it was a term that I've heard recently called servant leadership. Um, I hadn't, this is a new term to me. I hadn't heard this before, but I'm sure, I, you know, I'm sure I'm just late to the party on this sort of thing. But, um, but that's something that I think there, there's been a culture uh, shift, I think, in our company somewhat recently in that there's more of a servant leadership mindset. Um, and you know, that to me means, you know, that you are, you know, somebody that your whole goal and your whole job is to make things easier for the people that you work with. So whether that is, you know, setting a, a clear direction and getting out of their way so that they can come up with the how and the when and, um, you know, that, that I think is super important. Um, and that's something that I really buy into um, because, you know, you, you bring in people from all different uh, backgrounds and education and, uh, you know, you start getting some really fascinating answers and solutions to problems that you wouldn't have thought about, but, you know, you hire great people and you work with great people and then you really got to let them do and, and you got to let them cook. And so that's, that's something that I don't know if would happen without me. And that's something that I continue to, to want to foster. Yeah. I, and I, I think that's a good answer that, I, I can see the, the QA to PM uh, transition, but the investigator to tester, some people may be feeling like, how did you land that? Because they, in the, in the interview, don't they ask you technical questions about computers and networking and software? And so for that transition, for people who may not feel like, like they can't start, they, they have to start over, like it's a completely new domain. How did you make that transition from investigator to tester um, without feeling like you were starting over? Uh, well, the reason that it didn't feel to me, I mean, there was a lot of starting, starting over and starting at the bottom, I want to define as different things. Okay. Um, starting over, I never felt like I was starting over because I was taking the lessons that I had learned and the education and the mindset with me to the next role. So I never thought that I was starting over because I, you know, I was taking, I had a lot of experience in a related, but not uh, the same field, but applicable. Um, but, you know, for when I went into a technical role as a, as a software engineer, um, you know, there was still a 
a lot to learn. I mean, process wise about you know, how you write a good bug report, um, what is it, you know, what is the life cycle of a bug? I mean, there was a lot to learn. Um, and so, I mean, I was doing a lot of that on my own because I felt like I, I did feel like I was behind. And so there was that, um, uh, you know, what, what do you call it? imposter syndrome where you feel like you don't, you know, you got to really hustle and, and, and do as much as you can on the side to, to feel like you belong. So I was doing a lot of that, you know, research. Um, I mean, this was back in 2003, 2004. Um, so, you know, there was still the internet, but it, it wasn't. Uh, there wasn't YouTube videos for everything yet, I guess, at that point. Um, so, you know, it was a lot of, again, uh, talking to people, um, you know, being open, saying, you know, hey, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm just, start, just starting this, but I'm really interested. So, like, let me see how you do it. Um, it. Even something as simple as, like, sitting next to somebody that has more experience and just, you know, being there next to them, kind of absorbing the way that they're doing things. It's a little harder in, in our environment right now, but um, I mean, when I started at Microsoft, that was something that I, I did purposefully. Like I, I made sure that I sat down next to somebody that I thought, okay, they're not only um, seeming like they're really good at their job, but they're also someone that is open to explanation um, and, you know, just becoming their friend and asking them questions about how they do things. It, it was, you know, I, I felt very like I was like my education on that side was ramping up extremely quickly. And, and similar to jumping from uh, um, software quality into program management and project management, um, I didn't start as a program manager. I started as a project manager, which, I mean, the way that I defined it was, you know, project would be, you know, a finger on a hand and the program is the hand itself, you know. Um, and so, you know, I started off with you know, if, if that's, if that analogy, if we're going to run with that, I started off as like a, you know, the tiniest part of the fingernail on the pinky, um, because you know, they, yeah, I mean, I, I made the case for why my background in education uh, would apply and it would make me a successful project manager, but it, I wasn't proven yet. And yeah. so, you know, I had to sell myself, I had to make the argument and then find a company and a team that was willing to say, yeah, you know, I agree. I can see where you're coming from, let's give it a shot. Um, and then the same thing, I, you know, I, I shadowed a more senior project manager like day and night and followed her around and did everything she did and like learned all the things that she was doing and then, you know, copied that and then tweaked it and made it my own. And, you know, through that, you know, got enough of a uh, respect and responsibility that it grew and into, into a, um, you know, larger projects and larger responsibility and then program, which is then you're working with various projects and then it just built on it on itself. Built on it, yeah, I, I like the, that part of your story about uh, being a, a games tester and then being with your friend and with that motorcycle slide and then and then uh, like looking at that right, and saying, well, going from there to uh, LexisNexis, which is law software. So your background as an investigator, uh, and then of course, that's, like you said, that's where we met and we're on the C concordance project and, um, and the law project. Um, it just, that's just a, a nice way to look at it. Like, okay, how can I combine two of my loves, whether it be, you know, cooking and astronomy you know, like, or whatever it is, uh, something that pays the bill. If, but so that you're and, and you talked about how that choice was kind of made for us because it was a it was a strategic business direction where they they um, they dis dissolved the team that I was leading with you under it. And, and you had to make that pivot. So if you were forced to make that pivot again, again, where there are some companies that are doing layoffs, if you were to be laid off from Adobe, right? Um, what what would be your process to start thinking about these themes and what what you might like to do next without starting over hmm. oh man i i love and i hate thinking about that question at the same time <laughs> but um no i think i would love to stay in program management for me i i find that i even though i've been in it for over a decade now i still have a lot to learn i think the industry is is still growing and changing and so there's you know new um, you know, standards of practices that you're like, oh, let's try this new way of looking at it and, and see if that works. I think that's great. Um, but if, yeah, if Adobe laid me off, um, I 
I think I would, I would want to start something like entrepreneurial. Like, um, I, so before coming to Adobe, I was at a company called L4 and it was a small boutique um, consulting company. And they had this culture that was amazing. I and mean, it really felt like it was like my people. Like I came in, I was like, oh man, they, you know, the things that they're into are the things that I'm into and the things that they don't want to spend their time on or the things that I hate and I can't stand. Like it was just, you know, they were so process oriented. Um, they took the guesswork out of how you were going to do something and left you to be really creative um, because they had a very strong process. And so you just be like, okay, you got to follow this, do, 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 do. And then you could spend all your time thinking about the people problems. Um, and it was great. It was, it was such a wonderful learning experience. And uh, that company then was sold uh, to a larger company and then the culture kind of fell apart. So I think what I would do is I would think I would try to start a consulting company um, and try to poach as many of those people from that uh, from L4 that I could and start a, uh, a new consulting company that did largely the same thing, but try to rebuild that, that magic that we had. Yeah, again, that's, that's the collaboration, the importance of people and resonance theme, I guess it's clear in you. Uh, let me ask the question differently though. Let's say Adobe says, we're not gonna lay you off then, but we're dissolving your team, but you can do anything you want at Adobe because we mm -hmm. want you here, right? Is there something a department or a, a kind of more of the same ethos of PM uh, that you would gravitate for at Adobe itself, just as a company? Yeah, I mean, there are, well, there's one in particular that I, that comes to mind and I think it's because I have a little experience with them. And so, so we have, um, so the org that I'm in is digital video and audio. So we are the, the group that, have, you know, it's After Effects, uh, Premiere Pro, Audition, Character Animator um, and Media Encoder. Um, so it's all things movie and film and audio. Um, so if I was going to do something different, um, I think it would I would look at an org called uh, 3D, 3D and I. And the reason that they come to mind is because there was a time where there was a super small team that was starting to build this 3D engine that you know we were going to use um, in After Effects. Um, and they were tasked with creating this, this 3D engine that was going to then be used by lots of different orgs. Um, and they didn't have any program management. It was one of these kind of skunk works um, teams that just started up as like, a, you know, some executive somewhere said, hey, we need a 3D uh, engine and we need, you know, we need it now. So, you know, find it and make it happen. So I was loaned out to do like 50-50, like half of my time was with After Effects. That's the team that I was on at the time. Uh, and then half of my time was going to be in helping this new team get off the ground. Um, and it was, I mean, getting a new team off the ground, but having, uh, you know, a company like Adobe behind it was really exciting because you could, you could be scrappy. There was a, not a lot of overhead and red tape. Bureaucracy was really low because, you know, there was expectations, but they were far enough away down the, uh, down the line that, you know, you could, you, you didn't have to be, like, you didn't have a ton of eyes watching over every little thing yet. Um, and so that would be something that I'd be looking to do again is to join a small kind of a startup uh, um, project or team or org uh, within Adobe that you know, we could start something new. And um, like for, in this example, I mean, the 3D team was really cool because they were doing uh, you know, a lot of augmented reality, a lot of, um, uh, you know, building an engine that you could use for 3D modeling. Um, and so it was, it was something that I, I found fascinating just in itself as like a cool product offering. Um, but then also married with the fact that it was a small team and we could be moved quickly and, um, and you know, everyone was, was trying to figure stuff out. And then me being the process guy, it was really a joy because I got to can't come in as an expert to say, oh, here's how you set up a project. And you know, if we if we do it this way, then the long term effects you're going to see is X. And if, you know, if we don't pay attention to the you know details and you know naming conventions and like all the little things, and we if we set it up well the first time, then we don't have to ever think about it again. Um, and they love they just eat, they ate it up. It was really really fun to bring that experience and that expertise to a team that was hungry for it. That's great. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, there it's possible tra to transition within your company to something new, perhaps to to sure. either look at an opportunity that's there or create an opportunity or a need that that isn't there. And maybe if there's enough uh, buy-in, uh, then you 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 now are a startup within a bigger uh, yes. kind of safer organization. Um, at this point, I'd like to open up the floor to questions uh, from the audience. Uh, if there's questions about servant leadership or transitions or uh, uh, maybe even uh, ideas that you have from your experience and your careers in the audience, if you have some uh, advice for everybody else. Um, now's the time uh, that you can use the Q&A uh, tag there or raise hand and Shelly can open your audio. Um, so feel free. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see what, uh, what emerges uh, there. And... Yeah. As we wait good talk, for... Ben. Really good talk, Ben. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. I thought it was interesting that uh, John and his brother uh, uh, coined the phrase exploratory testing. And you came up with in, uh, investigative testing, which is basically the exact same thing. And that you guys are on the same page. I thought that was kind oh, yeah. of cool. Yeah, I know. James, yeah. James is one of my heroes. I, I think I have two copies of the Buccaneer Scholar book, one one that he signed and then one that I wanted to keep pristine. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, he's, yeah, he's, yeah. Uh, he's a hero of mine for sure. One of, one of my favorite stories, Ben, is um, uh, at LexisNexis and you came into my cube and I had that, uh, you know, how McDonald's does their Monopoly, you oh, know, yes. promotion every year. And, I um, yeah. and I had it up there because I was playing it and you said uh, you knew my, you know, create penchant for ideas and you yeah. said i i dare you to make an analogy about testing about monopoly and and it really was fun to be put on the spot and say hmm, okay <laughs> and i didn't think of color right away i thought of value like baltic mm -hmm. right is the lowest value boardwalk is the most and i th said i remember saying you know don't you have tests then that are really powerful and find some good stuff and tests that don't and, and you said, yeah, I guess I do. Yeah, good job, John. And I said, well, then you walked away and I said, Ben, come back, come back. I think you're onto something here. Look at the colors. What yeah. if we took this boring spreadsheet that you had and we actually put colors into where the high value tests were. And then to your credit, you took that crazy idea and ran with it to such a degree that I thought you should do something for QASIC, which you did, I think in 2010 or 2011, you actually did a presentation with the idea of what if we color coded our tests and use that as an aid for big spreadsheets to go right to like our eyes go right to where the tests are important. Um, and that was just the, that was you being curious, resonating with me, knowing me enough to dare me to come up with an analogy. And then you kind of taking that and running it. To me, that's the, the true spirit of the themes that have emerged in your career uh, around collaboration and wanting to make a difference. Um, make, make a difference there. Um, so I think it's if we if we think about our network, we think about mission, our feelings, what what fuels us at the end of the day, um, and these they really kind of philosophical, profound things. Like I want to make a difference. I want to help people. I want to find things that no one else finds. Then you begin to think like look around you, or LinkedIn, or colleagues at work. You don't have to quit your job. It may just be something else at your existing job that works. Or, I mean, here we are, Cordiv is a sponsor. They do right, short-term and long-term contracts. So I guess Joe and Shelly, like you can, you can help someone like try a career because <laughs> you have openings uh, around management, quality and different things. Um, Right. All then, kinds of have, things. Have, have people done that? They've come to Cordev and they say, hey, I, I think I might want to do this. I want to apply. And it, and, it, and it works. They can do a transition. Yeah. Well, you know, actually, to yeah. that point, um, I mean, to give Adobe a little bit of a plug, we have tons of openings, too. And, you know, for anyone that is interested, I mean, I saw Aaron on the on the call and like he's somebody that uh, actually a great case in point. He um he joined a, a talk that I gave to the UW uh, Business School a year ago or a year and a half ago, maybe two. Oh, wow. um, and yeah, he reached out on LinkedIn and said, you know, hey, I'm, I remember you from this talk and I'd love to know more about Adobe. And 
and it's all I want to do is, is, I mean, you know what? Okay. I changed one of my answers that you asked. If you said, if there was something that I would, I was going to do differently, I think maybe I'd go into recruiting because, yeah. um, you know, wow. Try like, yeah. all I want to do right now is, is get, um, you know, people that I have met with and I think are just, you know, totally on fire. I want to get them at Adobe specifically, because I think so highly of Adobe and I think, you know, what they've done for me and the, culture that they've built um i'm i'm protective of it but when i find that i meet someone that's just awesome i'm like oh man we got we we can't let this one slip through our fingers um and so i mean that's you know that's all i want to do is help people um you know that come to me that we talk and and they can show why they're awesome and that's happened a few times um cool. so yeah, so hey, I would cool. probably go at, at what Adobe are you located? Dunlong the Ship Canal in Fremont or yeah. where? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right down there and uh right along the um the ship canal. Uh it's right next to the Fremont Bridge. Um yeah. Google. I just live in Green Lake. We should have a few cup of coffee yeah. somewhere. <laughs> yeah, love cool. to. We have uh we have a hand up. Uh Dwayne, do you want well open your mic? Uh go ahead and uh ask your question. Over the red door. Okay, yeah, hi. Um, so my name's Dwayne. Um, I currently work for um, Locksoft slash Smashing Ideas. And I am actually a senior QA engineer who's moving into pro um, project management right now. Nice. Like today, I ran my very first stand up. Awesome. Um, spontaneously, because the actual PM didn't show up. And I'm like, well, I have a link to the Agile board, and I'm an extrovert, and everyone knows me. Uh, so I just asked, can I run the meeting? Sure. And so I, I ran stand up. That's awesome. Oh, um, yeah, that's a great, great story. So how did it go? It went really well. Um, people gave me like thumbs up and kudos. And basically, I just went down the list alphabetically. And just when people said that they had blockers, I was like, do you have a way to unblock it? Is there anyone I can contact? And the one person that had a blocker was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to talk to like, you know, I'm going to talk to Simon or Dimitri yeah. or whatever. And then that was cool because um, I was like, I don't have notes. I don't know what I'm doing, but I guess I'm doing okay. Um, so I guess my one question is this. Um, do you, I, so first of all, I found that experience really powerful. And I know that Scrum Master is like a role that's sort of alongside that. Yep. Do you find certifications to be like a really like useful mm. and powerful tool as a way to get in or not, or kind of semi how, how I, do you feel on like scrum certifications yeah, P, yeah. P, things like that yeah totally no i okay this is me personally um but take this with a grain of salt because hiring managers are going to be wildly different on this topic but um you know for me i like um uh the if you have the education and you know what to do if you have a a, a certificate saying that it doesn't much matter to me as much like um what's the goodwill hunting like it's more of the goodwill hunting approach right where you know you could go and get your ivy league diploma or you could just read all the same books and i i don't want to discriminate i mean all you know more power to if you want to go and get certified you know that's certainly a, a proof that you have gone through um but i wouldn't say that that is necessarily indicative of being good at these things um it sounds like from what what the you know the story that you just told it sounds like you would be you know you're naturally being pulled into that world of you know and, and that you want to take that step into you know making your life all about solving problems for people yeah and you're hearing okay you're you know such and such is blocked like to me i don't think i've ever heard in a scrum training that piece of the puzzle and you know they're like okay, here's how you do a scrum meeting you talk through you know what what's going on what's you know what's what are you doing what are you blocked and then you take your notes and you move on and then they're talk they'll talk about the next thing but the fact that you're like okay you took that um you know you you stepped into a, a need to find uh, you know that somebody was missing basically <laughs> that you yeah. stepped into that role like you, you know you jumped into to serve the team that you're working on to by leading them through a meeting that you felt comfortable doing mm -hmm. And that's awesome. That's exactly the kind of thing that I would look for in a, in a project manager and program manager. Oh, cool. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, to answer your question, um, I, no, I don't think I don't I don't think I would get as much um, 
like I wouldn't be impressed by somebody that had all this certification um, mm -hmm. as much as someone saying in an interview what you just said like hey yeah. I you know I was I saw a need I knew what to do I jumped in I filled it and people were happy with the result that cool. would go way further with me as a hiring manager um, than hey I have PMP certification cool and very cool thank you thank you for the feedback yeah I just I think I knew what to do uh, partially from like observing what like the PMs have been doing and mm -hmm. paying attention to what they've been doing. And then also I have been taking like, you know, scrum courses and all that through Pluralsight because I get a free, I got a free Pluralsight membership through work. So but I haven't like sit, sat for any of the certifications yet, but I'm taking yeah. the courses, like how to run a scrum meeting, things like that. Yeah. So I was yeah, like, yeah. oh, I have the agile board. I'm just going to do this. Right. And if it completely falls apart, well, hey, I tried and it didn't. That's, um, I love it. Hey, and Dwayne, I want you to, yes. to take my information down and I use me as a resource, right? Like if you cool. want to be um, available to you, if you have questions about program management or, you know, if you're something as is, is weird that you're going through and you're learning through your educational tools that you got and you're like I don't this doesn't quite make sense or why do they do it this way I put me down as another one of the advocates that can help um you know guide you along the way happy to do so cool and I'll definitely follow you on LinkedIn um yeah, sounds also, good. I'm on a um I'm on a cell phone because I'm also working at the exact same time I'm testing bike software uh what is your name again please thank you sure sure my name is Ben B-E-N and last name is Brodsky, B-R-O-D-S-K-Y. Cool. And um, yeah, my, my first name is Dwayne, D-W-A-Y-N-E, and then last name Lindy, L-I-N-D-E. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you, Dwayne. Thanks for the question, Dwayne. And, and what I love about Dwayne's question is, is it, uh, it, the two, two parts of it, the certification and the opportunity part. So imagine that uh, the person that was supposed to be the Scrum Master uh, wasn't there because they quit. And there's Dwayne. So now there's an opportunity. So Dwayne had an opportunity that wasn't there before. So things change in businesses, right? They emerge. People get laid off, but businesses make strategic directions for the positive. They say, we need a PM like right now. John, do you know anybody? Like this new initiative is spinning up and it caught us off guard. Like, who do you know? I'd be like, well, my favorite PM, Ben, he's already at Adobe. I could either poach him or maybe he luckily got laid off and I can snag him, right? So things, things change and move to your advantage. Um, so show up, like be out there on LinkedIn and post your thoughts about work, servant leadership, uh, reorgs happen if these priorities change. And, and so it could be that Dwayne not, may not even need a certification, even though the guy perhaps who quit, right, in my scenario, um, the, the job request, the, the requisition says certification required, but wait, Dwayne's already there. He's showing up and it's like making a difference. So they may go screw the requisition. Let's give Dwayne a shot. Yep. So it's, um, you never know where things are, are going to, going to take you. In fact, even Ben, when our, when at Lexus Nexus, when we were, when we were decommissioned, um, there were opportunities at Lexus Nexus itself. And I remember saying to you and the team, Hey, we got a chance here. Let's go out with a bang. Let's just do crazy ideas because we got nothing to lose. We're laid off. So let's just try stuff. And that that led them offering me offering uh, to others like new opportunities that emerged. Yeah. So you just never know. But as long as you resonate and are congruent with what your passion is, what your mission is, what you what you look at the themes of your life and that you've done, Ben, I think you're going to be you make your own luck. In, in that way, but coincidence and in, in your network will definitely help you. And, and you don't have to start over. I like what you said, start from the, you may have to start from the bottom, but it's not starting over. You're learning a new, uh, a new domain while bringing all your other domain experience to bear in this new, in this new world. Exactly. So great. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, we're, we're at time. Um, this has been as fun as I thought it would be. Um, I hope you've seen that, that Ben's just a great guy to know. We're kind of, he's, he's cut from the, the same kind of cloth of wanting to make a difference and, and doing well in, in tech and, and just in, in the people oriented yeah. uh, world. So, um, so Joe, any final thoughts before we close? No, man. Thank you, Ben. I really appreciate it. 
I'll come down by a lunch at Red Door or something. And Sounds uh, good. thank you, John, as always. Sure. Welcome. Great. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Shelly. Thanks uh, again, Ben. Before you yeah. go, is there? There's another SIG coming up, right? Oh. Yes. Oh, yeah. that's right. Right. There's another SIG. So just a quick plug for QA SIG, which will be coming up on September 14th. And we're actually having the keynote, one of the keynote speakers from PNSPC last year. And she's going to be speaking about mental health and leadership. So her talk is really great. I've seen it before. And um, I think it's well worth your time to join us that day. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Great. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We'll see you in two months with a new speaker. Yep. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks, John. Right. Thanks, Thanks Ben. Thank you. Right.